I want to start by uh, giving a word of thanks uh, to the Henry Center for inviting me to participate in this fantastic lectureship series. I've learned actually quite a bit from my fellow lecturers and panelists, and I hope to make a help helpful contribution today um, as I talk about uh, Paul and the pursuit of pleasure. Uh, so let me begin um, by talking about my favorite scene in Stephen King's movie adaptation, The, Saw the Shawshank Redemption. Um, here, the main character, Anne Dufresne, played by Timothy Robbins, locks out the prison guards from an office room and plays over the loudspeaker system the song Canzanita Sularia from Mozart's opera, The Marriage of Figaro. As a duet of sopranos sing in heavy vibrato, vibrato everyone in the prison yard is just stunned. They stop what they're doing and they sit there and listen and they get swept up by the grandeur of the song. And Andy's friend Red, played by Morgan Friedman, shares this quote, which is on screen. I have no idea to this day what those two Italian ladies were singing about, but I would like to think that they were singing about something so beautiful. It can't be expressed in words and makes your heart ache because of it. I tell you, those voices soared higher and farther than anyone in a gray place dares to dream. And for the briefest of moments, every last man at Shawshank felt free. The pleasure of music enabled the prisoners at Shawshank to transcend their gray, miserable circumstances for just a moment, as if something divine had gripped them. They soared with the song. And when they surrendered to that sweet experience, for a time, there was bliss. Many of us have had similar experiences as those of Andy, Red, and their fellow inmates. We have closed our eyes and been swept up by the raptures of music. We know what it's like to bite into a delectable morsel of a gourmet meal and savor its tastes. We know the smoothing comfort of sipping our first cup of a rich nutty latte on a chilly winter morning. This is my favorite thing to do in Chicagoland. Uh, we know the thrill of seeing our underdog team rally to an impossible win during a championship game. And so during such moments, we not only relish what we heard and smelled and tasted and saw or felt, uh, we let go. We let go of competing thoughts and we became captive to a euphoric moment. So eating delicious food, drinking coffee, listening to Mozart, watching competitive sports, or participating in other forms of entertainment are but a few examples of pleasurable experiences. And I'm sure without much effort, we can name more. We can even come up with an intuitive definition for pleasure. Most of us would define pleasure as that feels good, ah, experience. While there is much truth to this intuitive definition, in this lecture, I nevertheless aim to construct a more, on, more nuanced theory of pleasure. My method is interdisciplinary and considers the data that is drawn from ancient philosophy, ethnographies of human experience, uh, the sciences of the mind, namely neurology, psychology, and cognitive science. But however, my work gives primacy, because I am a New Testament scholar, uh, to the exegetical readings of biblical texts focusing on Paul's letter correspondence to the church at Corinth and their theological interpretation for the Christian faith. For what follows in our, in our time together, I'll ask three guiding questions. One, what is pleasure? What are the constituent parts of a pleasurable experience? Two, what does pleasure do to a person? How does it function for or against one's well-being? And three, how is pleasure managed or regulated? What agents, divine, human, or some complex of both, enable a person to direct pleasure for one's good, while at the same time avoiding the mismanagement of pleasure to one's harm? So now I'll turn to the first and second questions. What is pleasure and what does it do to us? So defining pleasure, a dialogue with the sciences of the mind. Pleasure remains a difficult concept to define because despite its being a universal human experience. The problem is the diversity of what makes activities pleasurable. If we try to isolate the determinants of pleasure, we find a single nature or unity among the different types very difficult to explain. We become hard pressed to identify a 
common property between them. Sleeping in a hammock versus exercising at the gym, reading a book or solving math problems, listening to music or dancing, winning a chess match versus online gaming, or simply eating lunch, tasting wine, smelling flowers, feeling the sun during a morning walk, playing sports and the like. These are all pleasures, but we enjoy them for different reasons. They evoke different feeling tones or mental states, which are attached to varying sensory experiences. At the surface, there appears to be no internalistic account of pleasantness to cohere the complexity of these activities. So you might be surprised to discover that neurobiologists, psychologists, and cognitive scientists have found a neuroanatomical basis for correlating the, the diverse experiences of pleasure. Human neuroimaging studies reveal, quote, a surprisingly similar circuitry that is activated by quite diverse pleasures, suggesting a common neural currency shared by all, unquote. Uh, th- this was a, a quotation from um, uh, some of the work that Krindebach and Barrage are doing. Uh, theirs is a biolo- there is a biology to pleasure that gives a uniform account to the various experiences a person can feel delight, enjoyment, euphoria, and satisfaction. So pleasure in this case is going is an aggregate of four interlocking processes. And so if you see on screen, it includes liking, wanting, and learning. Uh, and under that, it's uh, it, it includes a fast and slow type. So I'm gonna add the word valuation. And again, um, I'm depending mostly on the work of Kringlebach and Barrage. There are numerous publications in several medical and, and psychology journals. And they also have a, a, an edited book of uh, experts on the pleasures of the brain that was published uh, a few years ago. And um, so these are the works I would refer you to. But let's talk about three interlocking, pro- uh, four interlocking processes, liking, wanting, learning, and valuation as components to the experience of pleasure. So what about liking? Liking is the process which regulates the immediate thrills, delights. That's, so it's the feel good, ah moments that are experienced by a person in real time during a pleasurable activity. Liking also includes a climactic, satisfying, blissful, ecstatic, transcendent, orgasmic, freeing release felt upon the completion of an activity. So from the beginning to the end, from the climax to a sense of overall satisfaction, that's what liking is. Uh, the neural pathway responsible for liking is found in the basal ganglia, that is a cluster of neurons of the forebrain. These basal ganglia are the pleasure centers or, or, or what um, neurologists call the hedonic hotspots responsible for the release of natural opioids. Opioids and other pleasure modulating neurotransmitters are released when a person partakes in such gustatory activities as eating, drinking, smoking, drugs, and sex. This release of natural opioids is what produces the sensation of euphoric delight. So liking is the process of consuming something pleasurable and the consummation of pleasure. It operates in the opiate releasing hedonic hotspots of the brain. Another related process is is wanting. Wanting is a process which mediates the brain's motivational impulses. It's part of the person's reward system or reward seeking behavior. So in contrast to liking, which is an immediate enjoyment of pleasure, wanting occurs prior to liking and anticipates a pleasurable experience based on past moments of gratification. So wanting is an appetitive reaction and is often triggered by environmental cue such as the smell of familiar food or the sight of a luring figure during a romantic encounter. It is the neurological and psychological basis uh, for for the motivation of our actions. And it is the impulse to uh, to repeat a particular activity which in the past has led to pleasure. So wanting is linked um, also, uh, uh, sorry, wanting is linked to a second set of neural pathways collectively known as the mesocorticolimbic system. This system manages a person's motives to actions. It constitutes the mechanisms by which the feel-good chemical messenger dopamine is released. And many of you might have heard uh, that dopamine is that powerhouse neurotransmitter 
that is tied to addiction by reinforcing neural pathways in the brain, which facilitate a repetition of certain pleasures. Dopamine directs our attention to targeted stimuli. It stores that stimulation experience in our memory. The brain not only releases dopamine, but additional neurotransmitters and hormones. When we eat delicious food, drink alcohol, smoke, consume. In other words, dopamine helps us to remember the pleasurable experience that, that we have so that we'll want to seek it again the next time around. And so this, so whether you drink alcohol, smoke, consume drugs, have sex, engage in other activities, these uh, comprise a system of reward for certain both healthy and also unhealthy behavior. We are biochemically engineered and motivated to repeat behavior that triggers the same pleasurable experience over and over again. So wanting records our past experience with liking certain pleasurable activities and it urges us to pursue the same activities for repeat enjoyment. It often needs an environmental cue to trigger the, our hedonic motivation. So wanting is, and wanting is also the main constituent of another related process is called, process called associative learning. Uh, so associative learning or, or what we call thinking fast um, is the process that connects liking and wanting. So it connects liking with wanting. That's what it's social, we learn. And we learn sometimes intuitively uh, and unconsciously, uh, instinctively. So associative learning can, constitutes uh, the brain, another part of the brain's reward system and is responsible for that Pavlovian cognitive reinforcement. It's a kind of automatic neural processing that occurs quickly, um, is intuitive. If you look at the chart, it says things that it's unconscious, it's implicit, it's automatic, it takes low effort, it's rapid. Uh, it's high capacity in the sense that we can do a lot of these things all at once because it's unconsciously or done and we kind of default to it. Um, and it's ho ho uh, holistic and perceptual. Dana uh, Kahneman, the emeritus professor of psychology and public affairs at Princeton University, he's the one that colloquially called associative learning thinking fast. And it accesses the higher cortical, cortical regions of the brain and um, where the automatic cognitive experiences are processed. So, what, so let me kind of give an example. All right, so I'm gonna uh, talk about eating donuts, which it should not be a favorite thing for me to do, but it is. Okay, so when we reach for a donut intuitively without really thinking about it, this is an example of our associative reflexive learning connecting past liking. So I remember liking the delight of eating a donut. Uh, and, it, and, and, that, and I'm cued with environmental stimulus, the smell and sight of freshly baked donuts to produce a behavioral motivation to take action, reaching for the freshly baked donuts reflexively, instinctively, almost without thinking. And so you don't realize what you're doing until you actually pick it up. That's what associative learning does. It connects all those processes together. Beyond though, automatic and reflexive and fast thinking or learning is a slower reflective and controlled learning process. And um, this is what we call thinking slow. And I'm gonna give it the term valuation. A correlating and sometimes competing process to wanting and social learning is conscious, not automatic, mental processing, and it's, and it's reflective, something that I call evaluation. It is different from reflexive associative learning, and it's what Kinnaman calls thinking slow. Psychologists and cognitive scientists identify a type of cognitive control processing, and if you look at the chart that is conscious, explicit, controlled, involves high effort, you know, we have to be intentional when, when we do uh, our evaluation of, of, of a pleasurable experience. It's slower, it's low capacity. That means unless you're really good at multitasking, tasking, you can't think about too many things at the same time all at once. Um, it can be inhibitory. That means uh, our pleasurable instincts can be inhibited when we reflect back and say we don't do it, but it can also make a pleasurable experience more efficient because it's something that we've decided that, yes, this is what I want. It's analytic and reflective. So um, let me give an example of how reflective learning is different from associative learning. And here on screen, you have a salad, which is what I should eat, and Korean jjigae, 
which is a Korean stew, which I love, and, and, and uh, much more higher calorie and content. So reflective motivation co can cooperate or compete with automatic associative learning. When I smell my favorite Korean jigger stew simmering on the stove and consciously connect the experience with warm, comforting memories of my mother's home cooking, both my associative learning and my conscious reflection work together as a powerful and more efficient incentive to eat. I want to eat this. This is, this is my comfort food. But if I consciously reflect on my diet and my need for weight loss, my reflective valuation interferes with my wanting and associative learning with the result that I end up deciding against eating the stew and miserably settling for that salad instead. So when we attach social meaning and, cer and certain emotions to the biochemical experience, when, for example, we enjoy food and wine, not alone, but in the company of family during holiday festivities, we enlarge the mental experience of pleasure. Our delight can be amplified and further ingrained in our memory. To put it another way, even bad food tastes better among friends. I think we all understand that sentiment. In this case, it is not the food itself that brings pleasure, but the larger event of dining, which includes eating, the conversation, the festive ambiance, and the social interaction with others. The entire experience is what brings us pleasure. And here's to uh, the Lord willing, uh, making conditions safe enough where we can enjoy uh, th that experience together um, in a pandemic season. So what is pleasure and what does it do to us? In some, the neurosciences describe pleasure as a complex of sensory and emotional associations that connect sights, sounds, touch, taste, and smells with human memory and emotion. Pleasure triggers opioids, dopamine, and other neurotransmitters of the brain. And our minds can then attach social meaning to these feelings of delight, euphoria, and gratification. So as an integrated set of processes, pleasure can enhance the quality of life, not only because of, of the delight we experience during activity, but because of the personal meaning and satisfaction we attach to the pleasurable event after its completion. This complex of what we experience with our senses and how we remember them is what the sciences of the mind define as pleasure. So pleasure consists of the experience of liking, wanting, associative learning, and reflect, flex, reflective valuation. Scripture and Christian theology in comparison has language to describe these processes in their constituent parts and as an integrated whole. So this brings us to our third question. How is pleasure managed and regulated? And I might add, why does it matter? And to answer this question, um, I'm going to turn to Paul's letter to the Corinthians. So we are now in section two, a dialogue between Epicureans and knowers, Corinthian knowers and Paul. My starting point for a biblical understanding of pleasure is Paul's letter correspondence with the, the Corinthian church. Here I examine the issues of food consumption, 1 Corinthians 8, sexual pleasure, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, for the, main, for the main. And for the sake of time, I'm going to set aside the issue of leisure entertainment in 1 Corinthians 15 for another day. And I need to begin by setting that, uh, setting, setting, describing setting the letter, that there is an ancient dialogue debate happening at Corinth between the Apostle Paul and, and a group that New Testament scholarship has called um, the Corinthian knowers, the strong, the wise, is an elitist group that uses their gnosis to justify the permissibility of eating food sacrificed to idols. Um, in 1 Corinthians 6, it's scandalous, but to frequent and uh, prostitutes. And, and so Paul's addressing this group in his letter. And, he, and while he addresses this group, he also quotes Corinthian slogans, or he quotes the, the, the rationale and, and the, the teachings of this group. So when in 1 Corinthians 6.12, it says, I'm free to do anything, or in 6.13, food for the stomach, stomach for the food, 1 Corinthians 8, all have knowledge, 1 Corinthians 15, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die, and other maxims, these find their origins, I argue here, in a type of moral naturalism that motivates the Corinthians hedonistic behavior. So let's, let me talk a little bit about what ancient moral naturalism is. 
moral or ethical naturalism in its most general sense, uh, and, and which, which fuels uh, the Corinthian uh, knowers or wisdom groups activities is an account of morality and ethics which can be drawn from and consistent with the natural operations of the world. It argues the rightness or wrongness of our actions is not determined by social convention or sanction, but rather by the degree in which one's actions conforms to an empirically measurable naturalistic view of reality and human nature. So beyond this general sense, there are different and competing types of moral naturalisms, but the kind of more naturalism which my study explores is that which addresses first order questions about the rightness and wrongness of human motivations, actions, and dispositions. In other words, it's the kind of moral naturalism that was characteristic among the ancient philosophical schools that were contemporaries of Paul, whether it's Aristotle and his school, the Stoics, or the Epicureans. Ancient moral naturalism measures what is good, right, and virtuous based upon how a given attitude, action, or behavior is consistent with human nature uh, and contributes to a person's um, uh, fitness, health, well-being, and flourishing or happiness. So in other words, if you look at the chart here, um, if an activity is, uh, promotes well-being and health, it's considered morally good. If an activity is uh, what natural or not, is harmful to the self, is considered more, uh, morally bad. Um, if, it, if an activity synchronizes with the normative operations of the world, it's considered ethical. But if it disrupts the normal operations of the world, it's considered unethical. So for example, if, um, uh, if you know, any behavior that destroys, for example, the ecology of one's environment disrupts the normal operations of the world. That would be an unethical action according to moral naturalism. But um, the habit of recycling and reducing the greenhouse effect, that is an action that synchronizes well with the normal, normative and natural operations of the world, and that's considered to be an ethical action. So human beings are a part of nature's ecological system. And so morality or ethics of a human action is measured by how said action corresponds with or disrupts what it means to be human, human nature, or the natural operations of the world. And help illuminate the kind of moral naturalism and hedonism practiced by the Corinthian believers or the wisdom group, I want to compare the ethical account of the Corinthian slogans analogically and intertextually with the ancient philosophical discourses on pleasure, um, especially uh, the teachings of the Epicureans. I am not, I want to make be careful here. I'm, when I'm not saying or making the case, the historical case is that the Corinthian slogans are sourced by Epicureanism. While I might su suspect that there might be a genealogical relationship between the two, I neither argue for it here, nor is my theory of pleasure or reading of 1 Corinthians dependent on it. Epicureanism simply provides a point of comparison with the moral naturalism and hedonistic ethics practiced by the Corinthian knowers. The aim of the comparison is to illuminate the position of the latter, the Corinthian wise, for it is the latter with whom Paul engages and exhorts in his letter. So now we are on the Corinthian, I want, we're gonna look at the first Corinthians 6, 12 through 20 passage um, um, directly. So please hang on to your exegetical seatbelts, you are in for a ride. Uh, Following scholarly treatment of 1 Corinthians 6, I'm reading this text as an example of diatribe. That is a conversation between Paul and it, an imaginal, imaginary dialogue, dialogue partner representing the position of the Corinthian wise. And I'm going to also not only analyze this text as diatribe, but offer a slightly different, but I think exegetically important alternative division of the text between Paul and his so-called interlocutor uh, that represents the Corinthian wisdom group. So I'm gonna read the exchange as follows. And I tried to highlight the exchange in color so you can see uh, where Paul is speaking, where the wisdom group is speaking. So beginning with 1 Corinthians uh, 6 verse 12, the wise say, I am free to do all things. And Paul's response is, but not all things are beneficial. The wise say, I'm free to do all things. But Paul responds, but I will not be overpowered by anything. The wise 
reason, but food for the stomach and the stomach for food. And Paul responds, but God will render powerless both this, meaning the stomach, and these, the, and food and the like. Paul goes on to say that the body is not, uh, not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Then shall I take, make the members of Christ members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who cleaves or conjoins oneself to a prostitute is one in body with her? For it is said the two shall become one flesh. But the one who cleaves to the Lord is one in spirit with him. Therefore, flee immor immorality. The wise respond, but every sin which a man does is outside the body. But Paul responds, but the immoral man sins against one's own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. A few important exegetical notes as you try to interpret this text and unpack it. Um, one, the Corinthian boast, I am free to do all things, is repeated twice. And it's conditioned by the rationale, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. Um, so in other words, the wise are claiming, I am free to do all things natural. And since food is natural for the stomach, the stomach is naturally satisfied by food. Um, the stomach, by the way, was culturally understood as the seat of natural desire, pleasure, and more complex passions. So in the cultural conditions of the uh, Greco-Roman world, um, the association with, of the stomach with desire and pleasure has a long standing history. You can trace the development from early Greek writings all the way to the Roman era. Um, it is well tested in a primary source literature. So I believe a quote, however, from Stanley Stowers reading of rereading of Romans will serve us nicely here to explain my point. What does the stomach symbolize? What it is a metaphor or metonymy of? In Greek thought, the stomach represents the bestial, wild, needy, passionate, desiring part of the human. Of the human. Ancient sources most often associate the belly with the appetites for food and sex, but it can refer to other passions and desires. Thus, the Corinthian slogan, food for the stomach, constitutes an understanding of the stomach as a reference to natural gustatory pleasures and desires, and that sex, including Paul's um, critique of, uh, of what he considers to be uh, non-permissible forms of sex, porneia, can be likened to substances as food, wine, or even sleep. Um, so let me um, also turn to what the Epicureans thought about the stomach. So Epicureans' uh, leading disciple, Metrodorus, has this to say about the stomach. And this is a quotation from uh, Plutarch's um, How Epicurus Makes Life Impossible. Uh, and, and so Metrodorus is a disciple of Epicurus, and he's writing to his brother, uh, uh, Timo, uh, Timo Crates, and he says this, we, meaning the Epicureans, are not called to save the Greek people, nor to get crowned by them for wisdom, but rather what is called, O Timo Crates, is to eat and drink wine satisfying the belly without causing it pain. And in the same set of letters, Metrodorus again says, it made me both glad and confident to have learned from Epicurus how to satisfy the stomach in the correct manner. For the good is found around the stomach, Timocrates, a uh, man of natural science. Metrodorus here is not giving license for gratuitous eating, drinking, sex, and the like but a very balanced and practical discussion on the demands of the stomach. The stomach stands at the seat of Epicurean ethics when one eats and drinks and has sex moderately uh, without such acts leading to pain. And when a person can satisfy the natural needs of the stomach without causing harm to oneself. In contrast to the wanton glutton, the Epicurean sage satisfies the natural desires of the belly, quote unquote, in the correct manner. 
So he uses two um, adverbs here, orthos and, and ablabos. Orthos meaning rightly and ablabos meaning without injury. These qualifications are important. An Epicurean satisfies the belly in the right manner, orthos, in a way which does not harm the person, abab, abab, blabos. In other words, the wise person ne neither neglects eating, drinking, sleeping, sex, and other natural desires, nor does one completely abstain from satisfying them either. Extreme hedonism leads to pain, but so does extreme asceticism. The golden rule of an Epicurean is the freedom to enjoy natural pleasures as long as the experience does not lead to the soul's disturbance or harm. Contrary to popular caricatures, the Epicureans were not gross hedonists. They practiced a type of moral naturalism where satisfying natural desires for food, sex, wine, sleep, and other bodily pleasures were seen as a moral good. In fact, the word ta agathon, the good, is explicitly used in these quotes, as long as they did not cause pain. Their brand of hedonism was self-controlled and pragmatic. They exercised moderation. So hence, Epicurus on one hand can claim, the pleasure of the stomach is the beginning and root of all good, ta-gathon. And, and likewise, he wonders how life can be good and pleasant without the pleasure of smell, sound, sex, and other natural desires. Uh, yet on the other hand, guarding against unbridled hedonism, Epicurus states the stomach is not insatiable. It can be controlled. So, it's, so the stomach is the source of the good. Uh, do not practice feeding that stomach or natural desires uncontrollably, but do it in the right way, which does not lead to pain. Uh, because the stomach is not insatiable. We have the power to exercise self-control. So uh, the thir uh, a third exegetical observation is that uh, there is much common ground between the Corinthian wise and the Epicureans concerning natural desires and pleasures. It appears that both the Epicureans and the Corinthian knowers had their own version of belly ethics. The Corinthians put it this way, food for the stomach and stomach for food where food, drink, and sex were viewed as comparable pleasures and permissible goods. Th these natural pleasures only become dangerous when human beings mistakenly attach wrong beliefs or opinions to them. If a person, for example, were attached false ideas of romance to the power of natural sexual desire, uh, with romance and its ideals, plus natural sexual desire working efficiently together, uh, one's natural sexual appetite can, can turn unnaturally passionate and overwhelming. So the ethical system of the Corinthian knowers and that of the Epicureans were based on the right gnosis or knowledge. That is knowing how to choose correctly between what is natural and good and to avoid what is unnatural and false. Paul himself would agree with them on some, but not all of their tenets. They all share the tenet that food is natural and a created good to take pleasure in. And Paul even adds a theological premise that food, idle food sold in the marketplace can be enjoyed since everything that the earth produces from the Lord's and a part of God's good creation. Here I'm, I'm referring to 1 Corinthians 10, 26 and his allusion to Psalm 24, 50 and, and 89 that be, because food is a good or God's good creation, they're meant to be enjoyed even idle food sold in the marketplace. So Paul would agree regards to food. But where Paul would disagree with the Corinthian knowers and the Epicureans is seeing sexual intimacy as analogous to food, drink, and other gustatory pleasures. The specific issue of sexual intercourse, in this case with a prostitute in verse 15, would especially be problematic for Paul because of the conjoining or relational effect sex has between two persons which one does not experience with other natural pleasures like food. So the wise of Corinth probably acted on this ambivalence on how to categorize sex as a natural good and sanctioned their own activities under the idea that like food for the stomach, sexual pleasure is natural for the body. They would therefore have no qualms about intercourse with the prostitute, especially within the social setting of the Greek symposium or Roman convenium in other words, the Greco-Roman banquet or party where the Corinthians 
will most likely carried out their questionable activities and all three natural pleasures, food, wine, and sex were available at the greco Roman banquets in abundance to experience. So Paul's now rejoiner, a response to moral naturalism. If we understand the diatribe or dialogue between the Corinthian wise and Paul in this way, the exchange between Paul and his Corinthian interlocutor reads as follows. The wise say, I'm free to do everything natural. And Paul responds, but not everything's beneficial. The wise say, I'm free to do everything natural. But Paul says, but I will not be overpowered by anything. In other words, while the Corinthians are concerned about rights and freedom, their framework, the real issue is about power and authority, Paul's framework. The problem with moral naturalism is that the system does not provide the power to maintain the kind of moderation they aim for. Let me say this again. The problem with moral naturalism is that the system does not provide the power to maintain the kind of moderation which they aim for. And I will just add here pastorally, many Christians when regards to the gustatory pleasures think that moderation is a Christian ethic and, I, and there's nothing Christian about moderation. Anyone can do moderation. In fact, you can have an entire philosophical system as moral naturalism, as a philosophical and, uh, and, and, um, and rational basis for practicing moderation. And Paul's critique is you can't keep it up. Moderate, the, the, the system moderation lacks the power to, to maintain the kind of moderation they aim for. So in their si insistence on freedom, the Corinthians in Paul's view have dangerously made themselves vulnerable to another power. This power is none other than the force of their own desires. When Paul claims that he will not be overpowered by anything, Hupa Tenos in Greek, in verse 12, he is addressing something that is not that is much broader in scope than the immediate problem of frequenting, frequenting prostitutes. What Paul will not be overpowered by is his stomach, his passions, the power of his own desires, whether natural or not. Now for the most controversial part of my reading of 1 Corinthians 6, I have translated the Greek phrase, ha de katar say, not as God will destroy, as many commentators do, but as God will render powerless or make ineffective or nullify, as in the case of 1 Corinthians 1, 28, Romans 3, 3, and Galatians 3, 17. So if you look at the slide, I have a comparison between C.K. Barrett, who represents kind of the traditional way we've read 1 Corinthians uh, 13, verse, uh, uh, 6, 13, as part, of, and here, if you look at the chart, Corinthian, uh, um, C.K. Barrett, a well-known New Testament scholar, uh, translates ha de theos katar de se, as God will destroy. He posits this as part of the Corinthian rationale. The idea goes something like this. Uh, that since God will destroy both one and the other, the stomach and food, uh, Barrett explains that on the basis of transient nature, the stomach, the body, the food, since God will destroy them, the Corinthian knowers justify their freedom to do what they want with the body. These things are of no consequence because they'll be destroyed in the end. So what we do with our body doesn't matter because God will destroy them. Uh, this traditional reading is very problematic for several reasons, not which case I think it flies in the face of the idea of resurrection. But primarily since I know of, uh, know of no religious or philosophical group in Roman antiquity who would argue that because the body will be destroyed, what we do with our bodies does not matter. Let me say this again. Uh, I spent my entire career studying the, um, the religious and philosophical milieu of Greco-Roman antiquity, and I cannot find a single group, Stoics, Epicureans, or otherwise, who have the logical rationale that because my body will be destroyed, therefore what I do with my body doesn't matter. No group does that. No group says that. Both, uh, both philosophies, Stoic, Epicureans, or, or, or otherwise, were, were very attentive to what ethical um, actions or unethical actions a person performed in the body. Uh, philosophical groups would say that what we do with our body matters. It, we can, it can lead to ethical or unethical action. What is more, the translation Carter uh, gets say 
which, it, which is glossed as destroy, is unusual and reflects the particular peculiarity of certain English translations rather than the Greek, what, what the Greek renders. Um, it's telling that one of the most important uh, Greek lexicons used by both classicists and New Testament scholars, Little Scott and Jones, completely omits the gloss destroy from its possibility of definitions. Where destroy is rarely used as a translation in the New Testament, these same passages can just as easily be noted as render powerless. In other words, I think Katerikasai should not never be translated destroy. Um, if, if, if Paul wanted to use it, he would use words like apolumi or apoluo, uh, and, and other New Testament writers use that frequently. So what we have here in this statement, ha de theos katergesai, is not a Christian excuse to do what one, one wants with the body because God will destroy the stomach and food. Rather, I see this as, as uh, uh, something that Paul says. It is a Pauline promise. God will render powerless both the stomach as metonymy for desire, as well as the power that food, wine, sex, and other substances have over us. And just how will God render powerless and ineffective our desires? In a radical use of metaphor, Paul employs the image of sexual intercourse, literally a cleaving or conjoining, becoming one body, the two becoming one flesh in verse 16, to describe the oneness of spirit, a spiritual conjoining with the Lord, a relationship with the risen Christ of intense intimacy. Thus against the wise at Corinth, Paul has argued his central thesis on divine empowerment as follows. That is, it is through an intense passionate relationship with the Lord and conjoining the human spirit with the spirit of God that enables the Corinthian believer to overcome the power of wrong desire and to flee from porneia. Uh, the Epicureans were indeed capable of appreciating Paul's argument here because in a well-known maxim, Epicurus himself said, through a passionate love or eros for true philosophy, every disturbance and desire, epithumia, is overpowered. So one passion overcomes another. Um, our desire for God, our intimate oneness with God, which is likened to becoming one flesh, that, that one flesh metaphor is being used to describe the oneness and intense intimacy we can have with the spirit of God. Our desire for God should overcome our passionate desires for other things. By way of comparison, and Genesis 2 had, has at times been interpreted quite negatively by Hellenistic Jewish exegetes like Philo. Uh, Philo, for example, allegorizes Adam's physical union with Eve as a sort of pre-fall prior to the Genesis 3 account. So concerning Genesis 2.24, uh, the, uh, the two shall become one flesh, Paul argues that when Adam becomes one flesh with Eve, he prefers the love of his passions to the love of God. So Paul's use of physical intimacy here is not negative like Philo, it's positive. And it becomes a metaphor of spiritual intimacy. And it's an unusual interpretive mood on his part in comparison with some of his Jewish contemporaries. And now prayer and the spiritual disciplines. Here's where I'm hoping that um, I can uh, theologically uh, flesh out the pastoral implications of our reading First Corinthians 6 by talking about prayer and the spiritual disciplines. I have the clock here. Okay, good. Um, so I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 7, uh, chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. So we have a promise from Paul. Let me review here. Set up the passage of 1 Corinthians 7, which immediately follows our passage of 1 Corinthians 6. So we have a promise from Paul. God will render powerless both the stomach and the whole that gustatory pleasures as food, wine, and sex have over us. So he gives us a promise. God will render powerless both the stomach and, and, and food, sex, wine, whatever uh, gustatory pleasures that, that seem to have a power or hold over us. God makes this possible by using the same power which, which resurrected the Lord Jesus and will resurrect us. It is through an intense oneness in spirit with the Lord, a spiritual intimacy that is likened to the one fleshness of sexual intimacy in marriage that enables us to experience a passion and love for God that over, overpowers all other passions and desires. 
but how do we practically experience this kind of power from God? One way to participate in the life of God is through prayer. In 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5, we have a set of Pauline exhortations to married believers that has puzzled commentaries for some time. The passage reads, and here I'll, I'll refer to your screen, now concerning the issues which you wrote about, and here uh, Paul might be quoting a Corinthian maxim or, 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 or slogan that was popular uh, uh, in the church at large. It is appropriate if a man does not touch a woman. But Paul responds, but on account of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Let the husband pay back his conjugal debt uh, to his wife. And in the same way, the wife also to her husband. The wife does not have power over her own body, but the husband does. And in the same way, the husband does not have power over his own body, but the wife does, which was just rad radically in this last part, anti uh, patriarchal. Do not rob or betray one another of the conjugal debt, uh, except out of mutual agreement for a set time, uh, so that uh, to create space for prayer, and then to get then be together again, in order that Satan does not tempt you on account of your lack of self control. So, of the myriads of questions we can ask, for the sake of time. I only want to bring one question to this text. What is Paul's premise or rationale for why a married man and woman should mutually agree to abstain from sexual intimacy for a set time and place to, uh, for prayer? I mean, it almost sounds as if a believer's spiritual union with Christ can somehow disrupt, uh, be disrupted by one's physical union with one's spouse. Does sexual intimacy have a canceling effect on the intimacy of prayer, even if the se sexual union is not porneia, but within the marriage context? Um, I think canceling is too strong a word here and ultimately an, an accurate term to explain what I think Paul says about prayer and sex being analogical practices. And so um, to help us out here, um, to get some help with this puzzling passage, I turn to the work of Sarah Coakley and what she specifically says about the comparisons that can be made between human sexual passion and prayer. And in her book, The New Asceticism, um, Coakley states, and here it's on screen, in prayer of, of the sort in which we radically cede or surrender control to the spirit, there is an instant reminder of the close analog between this seeding to the Trinitarian God and the ecstasis or ecstasy of human sexual passion. Thus, it is not a coincidence that intimate relationship is at the heart of both matters. The early fathers were aware of this nexus of associations between Trinitarian conceptuality, deep prayer, and the connections with issues of sex. Sexual intimacy is a mutual giving of one's body to, to the other. So the wife does not have power over her own body, but the husband does. And in the same way, the husband does not have power over his body, but the wife does. In a Greco-Roman patriarchal world where sexual abuse was all too frequent, relinquishing power or authority over one's body uh, to another required a deep trust. Sexual intimacy between a husband and wife constitute a profound act of mutual self-giving and mutual belonging to one another. This mutual vulnerability, trust, and giving of self is akin to what happens in prayer when the one who prays, the prayer-er, who is united with the Lord, radically sees control of oneself to the spirit. At times, Sarah Coakley, uh, uh, um, as Sarah Copley continues, um, at times the experience of prayer is so deep, it can't be expressed in words, referring to Romans 8, 26. She describes a kind of prayer that is revelatory, you might call mystical, rapturous. She explains, finally, and here's on the screen, since Paul acknowledges openly 
that we do not know how to pray or what to ask for, referring to Romans 8, 26. And so we have to yield to the Spirit's size too deep for words. And it follows that prayer at its deepest is God's, not ours, and takes the prayer the one who's praying, beyond any normal human language or rationality of control. Now, make no mistake, Coakley is not talking about irrational prayer. The prayer the one who prays beyond any normal human language or beyond rationality of control, expresses so deep a communion with the triune God that words fail to describe the experience. Reason is not enough to explain one's rapture with Christ. That doesn't make it irrational. Your mind is engaged in the entire process, but your reason and your words, it's difficult for the one who's praying to articulate exactly what's happening with him because the experience of prayer in the community of God is that deep and that powerful. The prayer or the one who's praying does not have the words to articulate exactly what it means to embrace by God in this way. And you might think, well, wow, what does that mean? And so I, rather than turning to the, uh, the earliest church fathers, I thought to, to kind of make more concrete and real what Sarah Coakley is saying here, it'd be helpful to turn to the Roman Catholic monk, theologian and mystic, Thomas Merton, Thomas Merton, uh, anyone who, who's taking a program in spiritual direction knows that Thomas Merton is a major figure in, in the practice of spiritual direction for both Protestant and Roman Catholic Christ, uh, Christian counselors. And so Thomas Merton, in his book, No Man is an Island, in his journal entry number 14, talks about a way to understand how deep prayer can get. And he talks about in the context that there are many levels of attention to prayer. And I want to posit humbly here that many of us don't experience the kind of power that uh, Paul's referring to uh, in 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Corinthians 7, that Sarah Copley says is a part of the apostolic and patristic uh, fathers and, and, and a monastic father tradition about how powerful union with Christ can be to enough to make it analogous to human sexual passion. Uh, because uh, our level of prayer is just not deep enough. And, and, I, and I include myself in it. And so Thomas Merton says here uh, that there are many different levels or attentions to prayer. And I think he doesn't really count them out. Uh, I empirically, when I read his, his, his past, uh, the text, counted about seven levels of prayer. But for economy of space, I'm going to conflate these seven to four and categorize them as follows. So the first and basic level is what he calls brainless or relationist, relationalist prayer. Um, in quoting Matthew 6, 7, Thomas Merton says, in brainless prayer, we're just babbling like pagans, not really paying attention to our words. Our heart is not, are, are not following what we say. And so our prayers have no real power because in the end, we are talking at God, not talking with God. There is no real relationship with him. It is relationless prayer. The second level of prayer, you imagine going up a mountain. This is the image that Thomas Merton uses. You're going up to the mountaintop to pray. Level one is brainless prayer. Go further up the mountain. It's selfish, selfish prayer. Our prayer life is often focused um, on ourselves. Uh, we might, we can actually hear what we say and God hears us, but our prayers are all about the difficulties of the moment, the problems of our life, the trials we have to face. And God out of his mercy does indeed answer those kinds of prayers, no matter how selfish they can be. But such prayers only provide a shallow sense of peace. Why? Because as soon as the problem is solved, we move to other problems and our lives are one chain of requests controlling us led by one dilemma after the other. The next level of prayer is, a, is where we, we need to seek to aim, prayer that disturbs and brings holy fear. Merton calls this, quote, the better way of prayer, unquote. Prayer that passes through our complaints and preoccupation with self and goes directly to God. 
in the holy presence of God, we suddenly become ashamed that so much of our prayers, concerns, and heart has only been about me, myself, and I. We are ashamed, to quote Thomas Merton, to be so much aware of ourselves in prayer, unquote. And this kind of prayer leads to a holy fear, a repentance over how far our hearts were away from the will and heart of God. And finally, we need to get to timeless prayer. This is the kind of prayer that I think that Sarah Coakley refers to as rapturous, rapture, rapturous, where rationality and words fail to describe the experience. But I think Thomas Merton does a very good job for us here, here in his description. He says that we cannot get to time, timeless prayer until we have gone through the prayer that disturbs and lead us, leads us to repentance. Because when we repent, we realize how much more God loves us, has been patient with us, has even answered our selfish prayers, though we don't deserve it. We are now open to the Holy Spirit's guidance, whereas before we are guided by the problems of the moment. And then as we enter into the inner sanctuary of God, prayer becomes timeless. We forget about time. We are caught up in God's pleasure. We don't know if we have been praying for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, three hours or more. Time does not matter anymore. Through this kind of prayer, God reveals our heart and we change the content of prayer to match God's will. In that very moment, there is joy and bliss. This kind of deep prayer comes because now we are in the same spirit as the spirit of God. We are one with God. I propose that this kind of passion for God's presence is a higher order of pleasure than the purely gustatory kind for food, drink, and the like. The experience of prayer involves the whole self in such deep communion with God that Paul could advise believing couples to refrain from sexual intimacy so that the prayer's full self can be given to an undivided devotion to the Lord, echoing 1 Corinthians 7.35. It is this mysterious communion uh, uh, it is in this mysterious communion that God transforms and realigns the desires of the believer. Uh, prayer is, then becomes a sacred space for where God is at work in you, both the will and act for his good pleasure. I went over my time. Sorry about that. Um, let, me, uh, let me conclude. I started this paper by describing how reflective valuation cooperate and compete with the processes of pleasure. I use the example of employing valuation competitively to choose a um, healthier salad over the riches of uh, a Korean stew. I talked about dual processing theory and that reflective processes can redirect our wanting. Um, but the problem has always been, so let me just say that while cognitive scientists say that through reflection, we can change our desires, we have the capacity, the human capacity is there to choose a salad over a, a, you know, our favorite donut or whatever it might be. The problem is, is not cap capability for consistency. Statistically, valuation can not always compete with wanting and, and, and quote unquote win every time. Eventually we cave into our desires. We can't consistently and uh, fend off our desires. And so eventually we kind of, we lose out to them. So. That's why evolutionary theorists in the battle against unhealthy behavior think that legislation might be the answer to the problem of, of, of the lack of moderation that human beings do that, that eventually lead to really unhealthy behavior. Uh, and, and so one simple example, use legislation to ban junk food in school cafeterias, and we help people more consistently to deny desires for the wrong things. But I think public policy is not something that we can rely on. And Paul, in his discourse on the stomach and gustatory pleasure, suggests a different way to engage pleasure than simply moderation. The ethic model moderation has simply failed many people in the world where addiction can run out of control. And what I've tried to do here in this short exp exploration with prayer and spiritual disciplines is, is which, um, and it's not just prayer. We can talk about reading God's word. There's other spiritual disciplines. Prayer is just one example where we can experience such a deep communion with God that our passion and love for God overpowers other passions. 
But what I try to do here was find a venue or arena through which it's not at the area of valuation, but it's at the area of liking and wanting. Um, in fact, uh, prayer can be so deep that while we should seek to articulate our experience as Thomas Merton Lee so uh, 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 pastorally did, um, we might not be able to at the time in which we actually have the experience. And so what we see with prayer is in our rapture with God, our, our experience of God, God can actually realign human desires for the proper glory and the, their end. And he does so not at the reflective or valuation level, which is where things like Christian discipleship come in, where we try, or where we try to help people maintain some sobriety against addictive patterns of behavior. That's all in the area of the valid processes of dealing with pressure. What we have here is something quite powerful that at, at the level of liking and wanting, God can actually change our desires. I think this is what Paul means when he says in, in, in um, Philippians that God can give us both the will and um, the, uh, the, he gives us uh, the, the, um, uh, the, God is at work with you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's Philippians 2.13. Uh, so let me end. Um, this paper has explored how prayer can be an area for God's empowerment. Passion for God as a higher order pleasure can over our basis baser desires. Communion in God is our greatest delight. Prayer can be more pleasurable than sex. What has been not been explored is how believers can enjoy our work in the Lord, um, experience delight and meanings in our fellowship with other believers, or even how the gustatory pleasures upon Christian valuation can gain new significance, enhance quality of life, and foster worship for God's good work, good gifts. These remain other areas of inquiry for another time, but in sum, I guess rather than entitling this lecture, Paul and the Pursuit of Pleasure, I should have better named this Paul and the ultimate, uh, the, Paul and the Pursuit of Ultimate Pleasure in the end and for all eternity, that ultimate pleasure is God himself. And thank you. Thanks, uh, Paul, for, uh, excuse me, thanks, Max, for that, uh, that uh, pleasurable uh, feast of a lecture. If I can invite all the other uh, panelists to join in now, if they haven't already, um, as well as your audience to ask your questions. We have uh, a little over 20 minutes to continue this discussion. Uh, and would any of, any of you like to jump in and begin the questioning of Max? Go ahead, Christian, please. Hey, Max, that was a great paper, really rich, learn a ton from it. Um, my concern is uh, that someone could come away from the paper thinking that Paul is a hedonist. Um, so is that what you intend? So you, the first part of the paper, you talk about a lot about pleasure in general. Then you talk about, you bring in Epicureans, which are, of course, are hedonists focused on pleasure. You link them to these Corinthian wise. Uh, and how they're talking, focus on hedonism. And then when it comes to Paul, it's not that you're, that Paul is rejecting hedonism. It sounds like Paul is just giving us another pleasure to replace the pleasures that the, his rivals are, are presenting. So in one place you talk about how one kind of pleasure overpowers the other for Paul. Um, our desire for God should overcome our passionate desires. Another place you say, I propose this kind of passion for God's presence is a higher order of pleasure than the purely gustatory kind for food, drink, and the like. So, um, so two-part question. One is, do you intend Paul to be understood as a hedonist? And secondly, if so, isn't that really disturbing because hedonism is clearly false? Um, it's clearly a, a wrong view as most philosophers, and I, I certainly would, would hold and could explain in you know, in, in, in more detail another time, but um, I'd be very worried if that were to turn out to be the case that Paul's a hedonist. Uh, thank you. Um, I, my quick answer to your question is um, no, I don't think, well, I don't think Paul disparages the enjoyment of God's good gifts. So pleasure is a part, indicative of some of the joys of being God's creation and enjoying uh, created goods, but the, the Christian life is not hedonism. 
Um, and it's not, that's not the goal or what we call the telos. I think what I was trying to say is that in our pursuit of communion with God, communion with God and living our life in Christ, in Christ also mysteriously participating in the life of the believer in, in our earthly existence, that a corollary, I, I mean, this is, maybe this is the right, not the right word, but a side effect of our being in union with God and uh, being on mission with him, doing his good work, is that uh, God's presence brings humanity pleasure. Uh, and, and also is and our, our enjoyment of God actually has the power to override um, uh, our desire or wanting of other pleasures that can actually do us harm. Um, so, or give us har do harm when they're, they run out of control. So I would say that no, um, the aim of the Christian life is not hedonism, but that we somehow, somehow in this earthly life enjoy God, enjoy his good gifts uh, is a correlate or secondary effect or side effect of our pursuit of our union with Christ. Yeah, that, that sounds much better to me. I, I would encourage yeah. you to bring that out a little bit more in the in the paper. Um, good, good. Yeah, I can certainly, thank you. I can certainly accept that. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Hey, thanks, Christian. Appreciate that. It looks like uh, Chris and Paul both have questions. Chris, could you go ahead? That reminds me of uh, my Presbyterian youth, uh, where I was brought up on the shorter catechism of the Westminster Confession. Uh, where the first question is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Um, and, and so there is, a, there is a godly hedonism about that, which I think would go on to say that that enjoying of God is enjoying all of God's gifts in a godly way that he intended us to in creation. Uh, and maybe that matches up with something. I mean, a bit later I could talk about the Old Testament dimension of all of this, but certainly Ecclesiastes seems to have this tension between saying that there is a goodness about uh, eating and drinking and working and having sex. Those are all good things. It's a creation. It's a Genesis 1 and 2 good thing, uh, the Carpe Diem passages, and yet they are all, as it were, tainted uh, and corrupted in some way by the meaninglessness uh, of Genesis 3 and the, the world that we live in. But there is, I think, a godly goodness to enjoy, enjoyment of God and of God's creation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I, 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 I agree. I, I, I wish um, I could have uh, extended the discourse to other parts of uh, the, the Old and New Testament canon. Um, it is part of the larger project, and I am actually going to address Ecclesiastes as part of the larger project on a theory of pleasure. But uh, yes, um, I would say that to know God and do his will, and maybe side effect is not the right word. So I'll, I'll have to think about this a little bit more. I'll probably need a term that's better than this, but perhaps maybe a corollary effect of being in God's will is in fact we, we enjoy him forever. And, and so there is a Christian hedonism. I'm, I'm probably a little bit more reluctant like Christian, uh, Christian is to posit that as kind of the end goal or tell us the Christian life, but, but thank you. Paul, do you still have a question? Oh yeah, thanks. Max, thanks for a great paper. I, I can't remember the last time a paper made me think as much as, as yours did. So. Um, and I learned a ton too, so I appreciate that. I'm kind of following along in the in the question of hedonism um, as well. You you convinced me with that um, your reinterpretation of First Corinthians six twelve through twenty. I I think yours is better than the standard one, and the one that I grew up assuming was the case based on the translations that I that I was reading. But I wonder I wonder if there's a, an even better interpretation, um, sort of of what the overall point of that passage is, and uh, you'll be in a better position to pass a verdict on this than I will be. But just from what I see in the paper, you, know, you, you set it up as a, as Paul is sort of criticizing um, the Corinthian wise insofar as they resemble the Epicureans, um, that the issue, that the problem is uh, moderating pleasure. And so it's sort of Paul's critiquing them saying, it's, it's not about, um, you know, we, we have, you have to have a way to moderate pleasure and you're not able to do this. So Here's the, here's the corrective. But reading through this passage, what I'm struck by is the teleological language. You know, the, the food for the stomach, stomach for food, but no, actually, 
what's the contrast? Um, your bodies are for God. You are, and you are for spiritually union with Christ. Um, and so I wonder if, and maybe these aren't in conflict. They could be, they could be um, companion you know, components of the same interpretation. But I, it seems like uh, the aspect of, of Epicurean ethics that Paul's critiquing is that the Epicureans have gotten nature wrong. You know, they thought nature was the physical world, uh, atoms in the void. Um, but Paul is saying, no, it's, it's so much more than that. Your, your physical body, the, the point of it is not just to sort of use the natural signs of pain and pleasure to orient yourself and to, to make decisions. It's, you have to look to your, your real, what you're really for. And that is for union with Christ. Um, and, and that sort of teleological logical language that, you know, it seems to me is correcting this, this Epicurean view keeps showing up in the, in the later verses, um, culminating with, you know, glorify God in your body. So I just wonder what you think about that either new interpretation or extra layer to your interpretation um, given your broader understanding of this debate and ancient ethics. Yes, thanks, Paul. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Is there, why is there an echo? Are we okay now? Okay, great. Um, I wanted to, uh, well, I don't think they're competitive. I do think that they could, um, I was following a strand in the paper, but Yes, I, the, the language of the, our bodies for the Lord um, and not for immorality, that th those two verses are, are very much connected with one another. Um, so I, I, I wanna parse your question to two parts. So one, let's talk about the teleological. Yes, I, it's a big part. The problem is, is that the te telos for um, moral naturalism is, doesn't include aspects of divine intervention or enjoying something beyond the natural world. That's what more naturalism is. So nature dictates not only my ethics uh, and my moral, uh, decide what's morally good or bad for me, but it is the limitations of my interaction and, and environment. Whereas Paul has uh, a spiritual world, uh, the domain of God, the kingdom of God, that kind of impinges its presence and human history and reality that, and if the Corinthians uh, or the subset of Corinthians, the wise are not used to thinking on those categories, uh, having that perspective, then this is something that Paul is trying to lead them into and, and teach. So uh, it, it is interesting that um, in 1 Corinthians 15, there is a group that denies the resurrection of the dead. Uh, and so hmm. I'm wondering if that might also be fueling possibly the Corinthian wisdom group there. Now, the second part about uh, the body for the Lord, uh, we are with the Lord. Um, I, what I like to think of that is where it connects well, I think with the issues of, of our passion for, for God is that um, the moral uh, naturalism sa uh, says, well, it, let me, let me, let me refrain, pull back. What that language is, is, I think, is a language of mutual participation. So why does what, our, what we do with our bodies matter to God? Because not only are we in Christ and we participate in the life of God, but we are members of Christ's body. And so Paul says, shall I take the members of Christ's body and unite them to prostitute? Um, to put it crudely, will I drag God into the stuff that I do? Uh, at, because I'm united with him. And so that in, instead, uh, our, so it means that Christian life is about making decisions. Those that enable us to participate in the life of God um, and enjoy God and those that maybe are an act of betrayal toward the one we're united with, the Lord, because we are dragging that, uh, the Lord into the uh, sphere or realm where there is no fellowship with the spirit because what we're doing is hurtful, wrong, um, simply not a part of what God wants with our life and, and, and his will for us. So I think that um, knowing God passionately and doing living our life with him, in him, and for him uh, means that what we do with our body and that it's for the Lord, that there are corollary non-competing readings of the text. It's just another layer dimension of it. Thanks. Some of the questions are 
starting to pour in now. And um, a few of them, I think, continue Paul's question about purpose. So let me read one here. What about temple imagery for our bodies, making the human body a holy site that has a purpose beyond fulfilling its natural desires, but of communion with God? Or is life just a power struggle of finding the strongest power to help us avoid enslavement to our harmful, selfish desires? Oh, um, I, no, I would not disagree with that. I, I, I think uh, in terms of those, those questions read rhetorically for me. Um, no, life is not about just a, a power struggle. Um, but I think Paul, because he's addressing the particular issue of frequenting, frequenting prostitutes, and the Corinthian wise have came up with a, a way to justify their behavior. Paul is saying that you're not seeing the big picture. Um, it's not about choosing what's natural and unnatural, what's right, morally good, morally wrong. There's also an issue of power here. You're, you're going to find yourself unable to uh, practice the moderation that you're aiming for. And, you, and for me, Right living is about having the power to live rightly before the Lord, but that's not the sum of the Christian life. The Christian life is much larger than that. It's just that that's the issue that Paul's addressing, I think, in, in this particular text. And so I, I would agree. This, I would agree. And I think this is still in the realm of uh, purpose. Um, it's more a statement. You can see if you want to comment or not. The conversation reminds me of Augustine's rightly ordered, rightly ordered loves and his distinction between use and enjoyment. Only God is ultimately to be enjoyed. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. I think, um, well, I, I, I would think we can enjoy God's created goods, but because, but knowing that they are gifts from our Creator ultimately points us back to God. So, do they have to be competitive? Um, uh, so, I'm not. I would probably have to know a little bit more about what Augustine meant on the distinction between enjoying God and, and using good, using good. So, uh, but I would think that Paul would want us not to use goods. I don't, I'm sure that's not, I'm not sure that that's the way Augustine is using it. I, I would, I would need to know more, but to enjoy them as gifts from our creator. So ultimately it should point us back to our creator. Uh, and when goods are enjoyed, um, I don't know, idolatrously, abusively, um, without restraint or um, in incorrect ways where they become overwhelming, overpowerful, then I think it, then that's when it turns idolatrous. And then it does the opposite effect of, of remembering our creator and worshiping him for, for his good gifts. So I don't know if I answered the question, but um, uh, maybe perhaps I wouldn't make that, that kind of sharp distinction. We can do it both. Great. Any other uh, comments from the panelists? Otherwise I'll, I can take another from our audience at large. Hey, I am. Um, He's Oliver. And I, I just take Max back to 1 Corinthians 6, 13. Sure. Um, the concluding phrase, the body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, I didn't get any idea of what you might uh, make of that within your reading of the verse. Could you say something about that, please? Yeah, um, so uh, the body for the Lord um, and, and the Lord for the body. I, it, I, I, it's in the footnote to the paper, but... Um, but I didn't read it here, but I, 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 that's where I think the language of the mutual participation comes in, that, um, that we use our, our, our bodies are, they belong to, so um, it's, it's, it's a language of mutual belonging to one another so that my, I can't just do with my body what I want because it doesn't, doesn't just belong to me, it belongs to the other person. So. What I did do very clearly was, is I think that's why the prayer part comes in, um, in 1 Corinthians 7. So the, the language is very, almost similar. Um, the wife's body doesn't belong to her, but her husband. And the husband's body doesn't belong to himself, but to the wife. There's a mutual belonging. Therefore, it has to be a mutual consent, but if they mutually consent to refrain from sexual intimacy so that they can 
have a set time and create space for prayer. Instead, what um, the idea is, is that they'll be giving themselves fully to the Lord and experiencing God giving himself fully to us in the, in the boundaries of prayer. And, and whatever, for whatever reasons, you know, not engaging in giving myself fully to my spouse, it doesn't, now I'm not entangled by that so that my full attention and self can be given over to the Lord in the activity of prayer. So I feel like those two aspects are connected. And so my giving myself fully to the Lord and Lord fully, the Lord has given himself fully to us. The Lord fully participates in our life by the virtue that we're in Christ. And that means what I do with my body matters and I can't drag, quote unquote, drag God into the, the muck and murk of the world. I, I would want, for example, to bring back the temple imagery to make my interactions with the world, my embodied interactions with the world, a sacred place for God's presence and my communion with him. So I hope that answers your question, but thanks, Oliver. Thanks, Max. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Yes, this is a slightly different direction. Obviously you took us back to Genesis two, uh, do 224. I wonder whether there's a place to go back to Genesis 1 as well uh, in terms of the relevance to this issue of being made in the image of God because it, it, it seems to me that uh, the Bible especially the Old Testament has a huge emphasis on God's own capacity for pleasure and joy. Uh, I mean the, maybe it's, it's anthropomorphic but in a sense we are made in the image of God so you know God smiles, God has joy, God frolics with the whales in the ocean uh, wisdom dances at his side in creation uh, there's the song of solomon there, there's an incredible uh, and the, the psalm some of the psalms talk about god's delight and us delighting in him and his delight so i'm just wondering whether there, there's an element to explore there that the bio our biology yeah. and you very helpfully gave us you know chunks of dopamine and and, uh, yeah. and so on that our biology reflects in the created order Mm. Uh, something of what is actually true of God himself and therefore mm. we have a capacity for pleasure because God is is capable of pleasure in, in a very godly real sense I, is, is that something to explore perhaps you do in other parts of your work um, it is something to explore um, and I haven't done much work with Genesis 1 material I've been looking at Ecclesiastes a little bit more um, as part of the larger project and what I found is that, so I, I have, I'm, I'm trying to work through this. God takes pleasure in his creation. He takes pleasure in us. And so if we are made in the image of God, then yes, I think um, maybe a corollary to being made in God's image is that we really enjoy God and we really enjoy what God has created. So I do think that's something there. I just haven't worked it out. Um, mm -hmm. I've been, I've been uh, much more thinking about how, um, what words that is, does the biblical corpus use to describe God's pleasure in us? And they, they seem to be in the domain. So what I've done as part of the project is in terms of the, new, the Septuagint and the New Testament, I'm trying to see what are the words for pleasure? And I've found it quite remarkable that given a certain lexical word, it'll either fall in the domain of liking, wanting, associative learning or evaluation. And my initial, because um, I haven't finished yet, my initial work has pointed that, that God, it's the valuative words for pleasure. God is pleased with us. Please, with, is, that seems to be highlighted the most in terms of when God's relationship to human beings, but I wouldn't limit to that. I, I think um, uh, I just, it's, it's an ongoing investigation, but that's, that would be my preliminary response to your question. I think it, the enterprise would be very fruitful to pursue. Thank I'm you. trying to do it. Uh, Max, I have another question from the audience uh, related to the aspect of your paper dealing with power. Mm -hmm. uh, with your emphasis on power in the paper, what is what is different about power dunamis in 1 Corinthians 14 mm -hmm. compared to the rights, permission, authority, uh, exousia word group language in 612? Is it not more accurate to state that Paul's concern is uh, with who has authority over one's rights or permissions. Hence the claim about being bought in 620. How would you impact, how would this impact your understanding of pleasure and enjoyment? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So, I mean, I think dunamis tends to talk about power too. 
power to do something, power to do something that we should. Um, not all the time though. And then exousia tends to talk about power over something as the person asked the question uh, suggests, uh, but not always. So um, I think power is often a very complex thing. It's, it's both the power to do, I think when God, when we talk about God's power or empowerment, it's both power to do things, but also God acts in a way where he exercises power over things so that we're free to do what, what's good. So I haven't really worked out um, the complexity of how power to and power over relate. Uh, but certainly the, the key words, um, exousia and dunamis is gonna be part of that investigation, but I'm just a little bit hesitant because I can find in other places in, in the New Testament corpus where the, the strict translation of exousia power to, and the strict translation, uh, I mean, strict translation of exousia is power over and dunamis is power to, it doesn't always work. So I'm, I'm, I feel like I have to take it passage by passage. So, um, but I do think that uh, when Paul says in 1 Corinthians um, 6, 12, that he, doesn't, he won't let ha something have power over him. It, that is the language of domination. And he is worried that um, our desires when they're out of control can dominate us. And, um, and I do think he talks about how pow the power of the Lord is power to not be dominated and to ex experience freedom and, and enjoying God and, and his good gifts in, in, in a way that promotes our communion with him, doesn't compete as an idolatrous practice. <laughs>